Hi everybody, this is Lauren with Leatherati.com and we are privileged to be here today with Slave Alia who has taken time out of her busy day to join us here in Los Angeles for an interview. Welcome, Slave Alia. How are you today? Thank you. Um, I'm doing well. Good. Okay. Nice yeah. to see you. Thank you. She's got her tea. She's settled in. We're happy. She's <laughs> met the cats. Everything's good. So it's all, I haven't met Calvin. But oh, he'll be around. He'll come around. Appearance. Yeah, he'll come. Anyway, so um, let's just start right into it. Okay. Uh, Slave Alia, you are in service to? Master Skip Chasey. Master Skip Chasey, good, who a lot of people know from uh, various activities. We just recently saw the two of you at the um, South Plains Leather Fest. Southwest. Southwest Leather Fest, Southwest sorry. Southwest Leather yeah. Conference. Southwest Leather Conference, I get it right, because South Plains Leather Fest is coming up. Coming so, up. Right, there's so many acronyms to keep track of, right? <laughs> And uh, I wanted to interview you because I'm really curious, as I explained about this juxtaposition between Islam and BDSM, as well as this, uh, this notion of a, uh, um, of a female slave being in service to a gay man. Yes. So, and I'm not going to make assumptions about your sexuality, but whether you're straight or gay or whatever you are, but there's an interesting juxtaposition there that I want to talk about. Okay. But first of all, I want to admit... I think most Americans are quite ignorant about Islam. Yes, very much so. Uh, which is to our detriment, obviously. Yes. Um, can you give us, uh, you know, the thirty-second primer on on Islam and what uh, sect or variety of Islam you follow? Yes, um, Islam uh, culminated pretty much in the seventh century, so it's it's probably the newest major religion that's that's out there. Um, it's based on five pillars. Uh, Basically, uh, the Shahada, which is I, you know, I believe in God. Uh, uh, there is no God but God, and Muhammad was his prophet. That's um, the crux of it. Uh, we believe in um, fasting once a year. It's a month-long fast called Ramadan. Uh, third pillar is called Zakat, where we give to the poor, and um, it, that's a lifelong commitment. But there's a particular um, name for it and a particular tithing sort of thing that we do. Um, what else? Uh, prayer, daily prayer is called Salat, and we pray five times a day, six if you want to, like, extra credit. It <laughs> <laughs> um, never hurts. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm losing my fifth one. Uh, that, that's essentially the crux of our, of our belief, is um, it, everything is based on your submission to God, just surrender to God. Um, and there is no hierarchy, really, in Islam, so we don't have... Uh, oh, the fifth one is Hajj, taking the pilgrimage to Mecca. Oh, right. it's, a life, it's a lifetime commitment, so at least once in your life you take a pilgrimage to Mecca. And that pilgrimage represents what Islam stands for, which is um, tying our roots back to the origin of, of uh, belief in God, which is Abraham, so back to, uh, we establish all of our beliefs on the fundamentals of Judaism and the fundamentals of Christianity. We call them people of the book. Um, so we're basically the next chapter of that. Mm -hmm. And all of, all of their traditions and beliefs come into Islam, for the most part. There are some fundamental differences, of mm -hmm. course. But um, there are two major sects of um, Islam. One is, uh, the primary one is called uh, Sunnis. And Sunni essentially means the people of tradition. Mm -hmm. So they believe in uh, leadership, for example, from the most qualified, the best chosen, you know, type person. Um, and then there is the people of Shiism or Shia, the Shiites, uh, who are it's translated as followers of Ali. And Ali was the um, grandson. Uh, in law, I guess you'd call it, grand, um, no, he was, I'm sorry, he's the son-in-law of his daughter Fatima, so he was a, the husband of his daughter Fatima, and the followers of Ali believe that he should have been the next successor to Muhammad when he passed, and so people of Shia, of Shiism, generally believe that um, they, you must be able to track your line, your lineage back to Muhammad. Whereas in Sunni, Sunni tradition, um, its leaders are chosen from the most qualified, you know, the okay. best. Um, Sunnis are the majority. They have actually their majority is lessening. They have about eighty-five percent um, of the Islamic world, which is almost three billion people. Now we're about two point eight billion people. Um, 
and the Shiites have the, the rest of that. And within that, there's also some little quirks here and there. I actually follow a path, a belief called Sufism. Um, Sufis are what you, Sufis are sort of like the Kabbalah or the, um, what's the Christian mystics, the Christian mystic tradition. Right. So we're like the mystics okay. of Islam, um, where God is based on love, uh, everything is, is based on, the, on surrender to that love, and um, a little more esoteric, I think, than some of the more concrete fundamentals. As you can see, I'm dressed very fundamentally. Um, I am a fundamentalist Shiite, um, meaning I do, uh, I do very much immerse myself in the practice of Islam, in the daily physical practice of Islam. So that was more than 30 seconds, but that's... That was pretty good, most though. Most I could do. <laughs> I don't know that most people who ask them about their religion could actually be that detailed about us. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> I, I'm used to having to give a history. Or, of course, right. You know, and I, I do promote um, understanding of Islam in right. the Christian world, particularly. Um, so I, I do give workshops, weekend intensives on, you know, living like a Muslim and right. um, women's groups, that types of thing, so to try to culminate or fulminate uh, relationships and understanding so they're not. Well we could obviously spend all afternoon on a fascinating conversation of why there's so much tension in the world between different sects of, uh, of Christianity and, and, and Islam but what I want to talk about is as I said earlier this, this, this meeting of the, the BDSM yeah. and, the, and the Islam world because in, in, in the Christian world there's a lot of tension around anything yes. related to Sex. Alternative sexuality in issues. General. Yeah, just sex in general, and alternative is really like not on the table for discussion. Yes. What's the attitude in Islam? Um, okay. In truth, Muslims do share a lot of that reticence um, of sex in general, but um, really, that's for social uh, social interaction. So there are there are defined roles in Islam where women women are women and men are men and we do sort of prescribed physical rituals that uh, that belong to our sex mostly by tradition many people would say that's misogynistic or or sexist but um, it is a fact that women are more inclined to do certain things and men are inclined to do certain things just on a pure physical basis men are sometimes stronger um, men are taller, men are you know, more aggressive, women are the child bearers. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if that can really happen, you know, but truly there are some physical roles that are just common sense. Then the social roles, however, is where we start to get into some fine details here. Um, it is not permissible to interact with the opposite sex in, uh, in Islamic social circles. Um, we keep that contact to a minimum. For example, we don't touch uh, people of the opposite sex. Um, we uh, keep sexual roles, uh, sexual topics really don't come up in social circles. Homosexuality is a big lightning rod right now within the Muslim world, be mainly because of the internet and, and um, the availability of information, the availability right. of being able to socialize with um, homosexual circles. So it's really caused a big stir within my own community as to um, what to do about it. It has been socially, no socially accepted isn't the right word. Um, I'm sorry if I'm stumbling on my words here, but it's been a socially assumed that men and, men and women were the, are the only creatures that engage in sex right. um, and under prescribed uh, circumstances such as within marriage only and you know um, there's no dating we don't date you know inter interact in that way um, so the advent of homosexuality as an open topic is slow to come about within Islamic circles that's it's in many countries it's still actually um, a crime. It's still very much prohibited, and, and not only prohibited, but seen as a uh, uh, fundamental crime to society and humanity, that if you cross that border, you're actually 
um, infringing on human rights, that right. you're, you're going against the nature of man. I, I have, being a leather woman, I consider myself, when people say, what, what is your sexuality? Um, it, is, it is leather. And it took me many years to understand that it's not about sexual attraction to a man, sexual attraction to a woman, because neither works for me. It's something beyond that. So I'm now, I'm out to my Muslim community. They know that I'm uh, engaged in these activities. They know that I'm in service to a gay leather man. It is a huge source of contention. Mm -hmm. I've been banned uh, from many mosques in the uh, uh, LA, Orange County area. Um, and actually not just here, D.C., Washington, D.C., and uh, a couple up in Sacramento. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, I've kind of made, I'm making my rounds. Got a good things. track record going. <laughs> <laughs> but I have found a, a small community here in L.A. that um, are purely Muslim, purely of the traditional roles, and have accepted me for, you know, what I am. They're very curious. They don't understand but I sort of serve as a model of like, well, you know, I have these deep, dark thoughts too. And, you know, she's actually out there acting on them and, you know, she hasn't been struck down by lightning or anything. So I'm kind of like opening a door a little bit. Um, well, when you, de when you describe the, the precepts of Sufism, mm -hmm. I was very much reminded of some of the precepts of service. Yes. Of, you know, BDSM yes. and this, the, the power exchange and giving up of power to another person. I, I was, it, it resonated very closely with me on that. Yes. The BDSM, how, it, one of your questions was, how does that play into this? Islam, where I was going, with, behind the screen, behind the veil, so to speak, there is a whole world of sexuality that, that goes on behind here um, that is openly permissible. It is encouraged. It is... Um, for example, I've, I've heard, I don't know this for fact, but I've heard that within Christian communities for many, for centuries, it was considered immoral that if you enjoyed sex, you were, mm -hmm. you know, off the farm, off the reservation, so to speak. True. Um, that it was just for procreation. Muslims have never thought that. It, uh, sex mm -hmm. is to be enjoyed. It is, um, there is no prescription for sex. In fact, uh, in marriage, when we receive, uh, when, when we marry our husbands, there's a gift that a lot of us get. Uh, it's called a pillow book, where there are um, artistic depictions of how to go about it and suggestions and things. It's a little bit of a porno book, I guess, right. <laughs> our version of porn. So it's very much encouraged that the sexual act for enjoyment is very much encouraged. It's not restricted in any way. Women openly talk about it amongst ourselves. Men openly talk about it amongst themselves. We just don't talk about it together right. very much, if at all. Um, so that's important to know in the sense that uh, we do have cultural norms that have that do suppress in a way. And I don't really encourage the fact that we do talk about sex openly. I don't know why we need to. It's what I do think we need more of, though, is acceptance that sexuality is a broader term than just what we understand it to be between men and women. Right. Um, for me, it took me, it took Master Skip to, to bring this to light for me. BDSM, in particular, um, SM practices are essential to my sexuality. In fact, there is no there is, no, there is no sexual experience without it. Um, if I have a sexual fantasy or an indulge in those things, I have found, particularly over the last 10 years, there's, there is no other component. It, hmm. Nothing triggers it except for uh, going into the BDSM space. So in Islam, because sexuality is very much embraced and, and loved and... Um, practiced <laughs> openly or you know within a within a, a an acceptable relationship 
Um, BDSM practices are not secret in that sense. We don't have clubs. We don't have um, outlets right. like we do here in the United States. In fact, I don't think anyone's organized to that degree that it was even possible to engage, if, mainly because we don't bring our bedroom to society. Right. You know, our bedroom stays in our bedroom. Or in my case, the dungeon stays in my dungeon. Um, but it is practiced. I, it's just not openly talked about. And it's not considered deviant, either. Um, I think to the, to the degree that I've found in the Western world, the, all the toys, the implements, the gear, that may be a little foreign. Because I, I guess I'd call us BDSM practitioners of opportunity. You know, there's a spatula in the kitchen, and it looks particularly interesting. And right. <laughs> you bring it to the bedroom. We don't have gear so much, but these things are practiced. For me, um, physical, physical punishment is actually a component of Islamic society. It is, um, it is, whereas here in the United States you hear a lot about not beating your children, you know, not um, spanking your children. Um, discipline is very different. Than, than how I was raised. Um, physical discipline is expected. It is a, it is a component of daily life. It, or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a... I guess things can go to the extreme. Sure. There are countries, you know, that still practice, um, like, cutting off the hands if you engage in theft or something. But... Talking normal chastisement of a child, um, or or uh, you hear a lot about wife beating that it's common in Islam. It's actually not. Um, it's actually it's not permissible. It's just there are boundaries. There are there are um, acceptable physical exchanges that that are considered normal in my society. Right. Um, slapping your wife would not be considered acceptable, but maybe shaking her arm or something to get her attention in a physical way right. would be ex considered acceptable. Um, smacking your child, you know, just getting their attention, not about harming, it's about getting their attention, is perfectly acceptable. And then there are times, um, I think this is where my BDSM exposure really started was um, women, if there's a punishment to be inflicted, it's usually women who, who do it to women and men who do it to men. There's never this cross thing. So if there is a woman who's misbehaving or she's engaged in um, uh, how do I want to say, like um, she's not being a good wife for whatever reason, she's shirking her duties, she's not, um, uh, she's mouthy to her husband, uh, to anyone, she's just a mean woman for whatever uh, purpose. Generally the family will get involved and take matters into their own hands, and I'll, I'll give you a specific example. When I was raised, I was raised for my, the first five years of my life in Syria, um, we lived as a huge family. So my, my grandfather actually had four wives. He had seven in his lifetime, but four at any one time. Um, my grandmother was his fourth, uh, so seventh, but she was his last and, and his fourth. Um, so you can imagine the community that I lived in. Mm. We had she, four wives. Each of them had a minimum of two to eight children. Wow. You know, a lot of them had children already. Um, so nieces, nephews, cousins, aunts, uncles, just, you know, sharing this very large space. But, I mean, you know, each wife had their own house, so to speak, you right. know, little area. And, and then we came together communally for cooking. So, so in that type of society, you have to learn to, uh, you see without seeing, you know, privacy is very well respected, sure. you know, even though everything is obviously viewed and visible, you're not in people's business. You have to learn how to, you know, again, to see without seeing, uh, walk without being heard, 
you know, just staying out of people's space. Sure. But you see everything, you hear everything, and everyone knows everyone else's business. So, you know, there's a, a cousin of mine uh, had, re had been newly married, she'd been married for about a year, and she was um, unhappy in her marriage, was just really constantly nagging her husband, just really being disrespectful and mouthy, and she didn't get along with her mother-in-law, it was just a mess. Um, constantly bringing grief and arguments into our space, into right. our community. And um, one day the women just took it upon themselves, um, I believe it was instigated by her mother, um, just took a branch off a tree and just <laughs> started chasing her through the courtyard, just wailing <laughs> on her. And, it, you know, you could, you could be horrified, and oh my God, you know. But she perked up after that. I mean, she, I believe there's a way to... She came around, you know. She wasn't beaten into submission, right. but it, the message was clear. Yeah. Presented <laughs> a valid point of view. Right? Yes, we're, we're tired yeah. of your shit, so, you know, straighten up. <laughs> straighten up. <laughs> now, how, I want to ask, because uh, things in the leather community are very overt. Yes. Uh, sexuality is very overt. Yes. Our toys, our play, uh, people are very casual with each other in sexual aspects and stuff. That's got to be, the first time you came around that, that had to be an enormous culture shock for you. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. I had, at the, in the time that I was coming into the lifestyle as, a, um, as an overt option, um, I, I didn't know any of this existed. I knew how I was wired, but I didn't know that... I could that there was a whole community of people who thought none of us did before we came into it. So, <laughs> so, so when I did, um, I admit I was in a point of my life where I was denying everything. I was denying um, God. I was denying my religion. So I was in a space. I was in a pretty lost space where I was just pretty much hedonistic and allowed everything, um, try anything once, you know, kind of thing. So at at the time, my sensibilities were shocked. But I wasn't this. I wasn't um, in the practice of Islam. I had taken probably four years off, I'd Got say. And there, so that's how I came into it. Then when I came into service to Master Skip, which was in 2003, I had already, the light switch had already come on in the sense of like, okay, I'm now indulging in all this, um, but I'm still not fulfilled. I'm still lost. I, I really don't know what I want. I went through with a marriage, I got married, um, big Muslim ceremony, you know, that I held at a leather space. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, um, it, was, it was sort of like I was, I was bound and determined that somehow these were going to work. So after my marriage, um, that's when the conservative switch kind of came back on. And it's like, well, you know, there's a way I need to be living my life, there's a, there's a, um, I wanted my Muslim community back, you know, that type of thing. Um, and it was diff that was probably the most difficult time, was because in that time period I met Master Skip. I met him in 2002 at a butchman's, no right. less. My husband and I decided to go to this leather-intensive weekend to save our marriage. We were right. struggling. Um, I'm clearly off this Muslim path, and my husband was more into like Native American. Okay. I met Master Skip. Um, we both met met him at this the same weekend, um, and he he made a huge impact on the both of us. Um, that weekend, that the very moment I laid laid eyes on him, there was a uh, powerful spiritual experience that happened for me. Um, I couldn't define it at the time, but my hackles went up. So it, it was, for me at the time, when I would get uh, this hit from the universe, whatever you want to call it, um, I would immediately get defensive. So I immediately went on defense with Master Skip, and uh, you know, the big pit bull came out, and I was pretty <laughs> you know, dominant and, and, you know, you don't scare me kind of thing. And, um, Did he see through that? Yes. With, I mean, to him, I'm like this little yappy chihuahua. Um, there's no pit bull as far as he's <laughs> concerned. So. Well, chihuahuas are pretty tough, so I would, I, I don't sell yourself short on that. So, you know. so he, uh, 
what's funny about that weekend is we both, both my husband and I, ended up approaching Master Skip in an effort for them to fix the other. You know, oh my God, my wife is driving me nuts, will you please fix my wife? Oh my God, my husband is driving me nuts, will you please fix my husband? Um, it took me a year to come around, but I eventually... Um, contacted Master Skip to ask him if um, we might spend some time together. And were you still married at the time? When oh, yes. I was, it was with, this is with my husband's blessing and yeah. you know, encouragement. Um, so long story short, I did contact Master Skip. He invited me out to here. We were living in Phoenix at the time. He invited me to his house to spend a weekend with him. That was in um, May of 2003. In by June of 2003, I, I knew that this was the man I'm supposed to ask to uh, be in service to, to be my master. Um, I'd never had one before. I didn't, other than God, I didn't know um, what that would mean. I, I just knew that this man was going to be instrumental in the rest of my life, if not the next part of my life. Um, so he, uh, I asked him, I petitioned him to take me on. And um, his answer was public, unfortunately, and it said, he said, um, my answer is no, my answer is not no, but not now. Mm. So it was kind of a no, but. <coughs> I can so, hear Skip saying that. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> So I um, accepted that. He, he came and spent some time with my husband and I and um, talked through his reasons and whatnot. And life continued to deteriorate for both my husband and I, not just in the marriage, but we were each going through stuff that we just did not understand or know how to deal with, and we took it out on each other. Sure. Um, by November of that year... Uh, Master Skip and I were engaged in a session, he calls them sessions, which is much more respectful to me than play. Um, because what we do isn't just about playing. It's much deeper than that. We had a session in public at a butchman's, another butchman's, and um, it was, he asked me, uh, he asked me three fundamental questions. Not just then, these are the third or fourth time he's asked these questions, but he asked me that night, um, who are you? I said, I'm still trying to figure that out. What do you want? And the answer I had then was, I want to be like you. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but um, it, sen it has since defined my religion it has since defined my spirituality and has since defined our relationship. Mm -hmm. The answer, I want to be like you, um, that night was the start of that journey to become like Master Skip. Um, and I don't want to mean that in the literal sense. You know, I have no desire to be a hot, hunky leather man. <laughs> um, I miss the parts to do that. But uh, I'm quite happy with the parts I have. Um, but there's an internal calmness, a serenity, a, a joy um, that I wanted. I didn't know the words for it then. I couldn't even tell you exactly what it was. But there was a self-actualization, a self-realization that I wanted that. And that night is what started it. And Master Skip had a hit that this was no normal this wasn't a session for a friend this was actually a slave development session and he said he'd never had one of those except for people who were in service to him and so it was shortly after then that I um, petitioned him again and this time he said yes and so we've been in service since November of 2003 um, I was living in DC at the time um, working in DC I should say and so I had engaged uh, one of Master Skip's requirements of being in service is you must have a spiritual practice. Um, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's a an affirming, you know, life positive spiritual practice. And I immediately knew that I'm 
supposed to go back into the Muslim community. And so, um, but I didn't know how to do that because my Muslim, I was afraid that it, it I was afraid that I would have no support in doing that because for one, he's gay. For two, um, he's a man. Um, he's unmarried. Um, he's I'll not, bet he didn't bat an eye, did he? Not at all. Yeah. Oh no, he's he's not old enough. He there's a, there there are relationships. There are master slave type relationships within the Islamic world that look more like student teacher. So Master Skip has always, in fact, his his name. Um, his title that I call him is called Mudaris. He's Mudaris is a is teacher, but in the, with a capital T, right. you know, spiritual teacher. And I'm his student to Aliba, and uh, that has been the nature of our spiritual relationship all these years. He also has a big father archetype. Um, so for me, he he does play a father role. He would absolutely deny there's any daddy girl thing whatsoever, but I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't. Um, I believe there is a daddy a daddy component. Uh, if you have to put it in BDSM terms, right. definitely a father figure in my life. So now, <clears throat> how does uh, there are a variety of ways of service. There are as many flavors of master-slave relationships as there are relationships. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing, though, that a lot of people, to make a generality, that a lot of people are, are uh, unclear about a lot of times is what it really means to be in service yes. to someone. Because yes. there is sexual service, yes. there is non-sexual service, there is service in the same household, there's service living apart from each other. And you want to tell us a little bit about your situation and, how, and what that means for you and, and Master Skip? Yes, because this, this does actually confound the leather world. Um, I, I believe we were a source of confoundment um, when I came into the family. Um, if you want to talk about a gay leather man, he's, he's a Kinsey Six. There is no question about his sexuality. Um, and yet, there is a uh, erotic you know, component to our relationship. So how, how it works for us, for how, how service is, is he has, um, he distinguishes between lifelong commitments and, um, I don't know another word for it, non-lifelong commitments. <laughs> it doesn't have a term, but it, it's different. So the people who are in lifelong commitment to him um, have the privilege of calling him master, um, he calls them his slave, so they are. It's an ownership kind of component to it. Um, we all live separately, so I'm talking specifically. He has a pup. Um, he has a boy. He has a slave, slave Rick, and I'm the only person in the family and the only female currently um, who is in service. So my title is. Uh, slave Alia in service to Master Skip. I don't have the privilege of calling him master. Um, I don't, for example, have a key to his house. Um, I don't, I only get to wear my collar um, when I'm in his presence and he puts it on and when I leave his presence he takes it off. So, but the service component actually is, entire, is, is entirely the same. Um, and what that means is may squig some people out. What that means is everything is on the table. There is absolutely nothing he cannot ask me, tell me, order me to do, um, or not do, such as the case may be. He, um, he does have his own boundaries, and those are, he won't, he, he's promised uh, in our commitment exchange, so to speak, um, he's promised to not give, give an order that will interfere with my bio family, that will interfere with my spiritual practice, or that will interfere um, with my financial security, or so my, my job or whatever. Um, and everything else is in exchange, he gets my obedience 
for anything for anything else. So what that means is, um, as menial as the chores that are to be done around the house, to um, this interview, for example, to um, sessions. You know, anything in the BDSM world is absolutely on the table. There's nothing. We don't have safe words or limits or negotiation. Um, that's just not a construct of our relationship. It's based purely on trust, on obedience, and ultimately on surrender. And Master Skip, in the physical sense, and somewhat on the spiritual sense, represents my physical interaction with God. I mean, he, he represents how I want my relationship with God to be. I want to be able to say yes to the order. I want to be able to um, always say yes to the universe, to God, to whatever um, I'm being called to do. I want uh, obedience provides a structure. It provides security. It provides um, knowing your place in the world, uh, trust is is in, is implicit in the sense that um, it is earned. I will say I come from a long history of abuse and um, violence. So not not from the Islamic part of my life, but just other aspects of my life that seemed insurmountable. I mean, trust is a hard thing. For me to give, um, so not just for my physical safety, but my emotional health and my just that he has my greatest good at heart. And then surrender is the is the ultimate goal. Or it's not just about obedience. It's not just about him directing behavior, but about alignment of will. That my will aligns with his, and I now want what he wants, and and that's just ultimately what I want with God. So hmm. that's, in a nutshell, how Islam, or how my religion, plays into um, my relationship with Master Skip. There are boundaries that are crossed um, that I, I've had to just come to terms with. It is not acceptable in my religion to be in a relationship with a man who is not my husband. It is not acceptable for me to be exposed, um, like without uh, without my collarbone, shoulders, elbows, and knees covered, in the presence of men that are not my immediate family: my father, grandfather, uncle, brother. Um, Master Skip and the family have, have become my family. I don't have an Islamic family any longer. I have a mother um, who is Muslim, and uh, I rarely get to see her because uh, of her own marital obligations and distance. We don't get to see each other much. Um, but I don't have an Islamic family any longer, so my family has become my other family. You know, it takes it to another level entirely. We all talk about having our own, making our own families within mm -hmm. the leather community, which we all do, uh, with rare exceptions. I, mean, I think it's rare the families that are totally accepting of all of our alternative lifestyles. Uh, but we make our own families. Yes. But you truly have made yes. a family because the familial uh, boundaries and obligations and and, uh, and and precepts are vastly different from where you're coming from. Yes. Than what most of us are used to. Yes. Um, that's a huge step. It is, and it, it was actually uh, necessary for this integration. I, I, I am a not only a staunch supporter. That's just too trite. I am. I'm trying to model that it is possible to integrate your faith, your spirituality, with your sexuality, um, and and that they're not only compatible, but they're necessary components of the whole. You, you can't compartmentalize these things. I was told early on by one of my Sufi teachers that it was not going to be possible to integrate my sexual lifestyle with Islam, that I was going to have to make a choice at some point. 
and I, I just refuse to do so. I, I just refuse. So, Master Skip has he's he's had to make and my family have had to make some hard choices too because gay people in general have enough to worry about you know <laughs> to contend with in the world without adding well let's just add you know a Muslim component to it now and so now when we're out on the street you know here in LA we don't get this but say in like Raleigh North Carolina you know we've been to an event there um, where gay people maybe not ha they don't have uh, quite the community that we do out here so they may be a little more noticed particularly now we add leather to that so we're even more noticed and now we add a Muslim woman to right. the bunch you know so I have I have um, I've been I have ma I do make conscious decisions about wearing the veil, not wearing the veil, when I'm around my leather family, solely for their safety, for their safety. Right. I don't, unless I'm strongly called to it for a particular reason, I generally don't wear my veil of when we're out in public together. Um, and that's a mix. It's, right. it's Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But it's, Have you experienced a lot of rejection in the leather community? <laughs> Actually, um, at Southwest, this last time was the... Uh, I don't wear my veil a lot at leather events because I, I don't think... For Actually, right off the bat, they think that I'm not part of them. You mm -hmm. know, I'm clearly just a guest at the hotel, you know, that is staying there for an airport delay or something. Um, Maybe leather veil might work. In I I've, I've actually <laughs> would like to order one, but it would be very hot for one. But True. Still, um, I do have limitations, but I will say at Southwest this last time, I made a point of wearing the veil the entire weekend. I, I wasn't going to compromise. Now, yes, I wore a veil with a corset, which may be an oxymoron, you know, <laughs> but... It's a bit late for oxymorons. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I was making a statement too. I, I did that consciously, right. and Master Skip got it as soon as I, you know, uh, as soon as he came to lace me up, he knew instantly what I was there to do. And he has some discomfort with the veil. He wasn't raised around it, you know. He understands why I wear it. It's it is. Um, a necessity to my religious practice, but um, it does squick him out sometimes. And he's learned to deal with his stuff, and I learned to deal with mine, and we somehow meet in the middle. Um, he would not order me not to wear it, for example. But I have been told that they would be incompatible. And so at Southwest, I, I experienced for the first time, I've often wondered what people think. A lot of people felt encouraged to come up to me and actually ask and talk about it and because they too have spiritual challenges and they don't get how I mean Christians and gays for example a lot of a lot of gay men still think that they can't be gay and be Christian yes you can <laughs> yes you can so I think I modeled that and then I found out Master Skip and I both heard this we did find out that some people thought I was veiling because Master Skip has a fetish for it and he oh. wanted me to wear it like that. <laughs> that cracked us up. I, I will say I've not heard that one before. Um, uh, it's, it's not a fetish of Master Skip. <laughs> I promise. Well, it's compatible with the uh, with the suspicions we have in our community that everyone's got a fetish out there. So I guess I guess that sort of works. It, so I totally got it when yeah. we heard it, but it, it just never dawned on me that... That's okay. amazing. Now, speaking of Southwest, you told a really amazing story okay. uh, about an encounter you had on a plane. Master Please, Bert told it. Well, Master Bert told it, and yeah. then you sort of reiterated That's right, yeah, Master Bert uh, let, let the bird out of the closet. It was a fantastic story. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yes, the story Lauren's talking about is um, I used to, working in Washington, D.C., I, um, uh, it's not even Washington, D.C., that just happened to be a location, but I, I have to travel all over the world uh, doing what I do. Um, and this particular uh, job I had uh, was located out of D.C., so I would commute. I 
refused to move there, so I would keep a corporate apartment there and would commute back and forth to Phoenix or to L.A., depending on where I, if I was seeing my husband or if I was seeing uh, Master Skip that weekend. And uh, one day, um, because I flew so much, I got first class um, pretty much all the time. And um, I had a particular seat that I always liked, third row aisle. You know, I liked that seat. Um, there's a reason for it, too, but it's related to another story. But um, I'm pretty particular about my seating uh, on airplanes when I can see to my comfort. So this particular day, I get on the plane. Um, I'm, I'm already in, settled in and unpacked, and I'm reading a book and uh, drinking the drink, the orange juice that they brought. And um, Planes delayed. Now, now, you know, here we go. It's Dulles. You know, it's Thursday night. Pretty heavy traffic and whatnot. So, um... I'm sitting there on the plane just waiting, uh, bored out of my mind, and Secret Service comes on the plane, and they do a scan of the plane, and this is um, not uncommon, you know, um, coming from this area, you know, from the D.C. area. Um, I figured it was a congressman or a senator, maybe um, one of the secretaries, you know, who, who knows. Uh, so well, they do a scan, and, and um, next, and I'm dressed as this. So I actually had this kind of outfit on um, at this time, and this is um, shortly after 9/11. So this is probably 2004, in the spring of 2004, um, maybe 2005 even. I don't recall the year. Uh, so they're giving me the eye. They're you know, checking me out, checking my neighbors out on the plane, and and I'm I know how to play the game. You just ignore it and um, keep your eyes down. Don't do anything sudden or suspicious, and keep your hands visible. You know, try to make everybody as comfortable as possible. And they leave the plane. One stands. One's now standing up here, and he's staring at me. Well, you can't really tell. He wears those right. sunglasses and the earpiece. I'm assuming he's staring at me. So. Um, Next thing I know, a couple more come on board the plane, and they come to my seat, and they ask me if I'd be willing to relinquish my seat and move over to the window seat. I will tell you that I didn't want to give up my seat because I like this seat. I go to great lengths to get that seat, and I don't really want the window seat. <laughs> um, but it was sort of a moment that you could tell... You, you just needed to move over. So they said they had a VIP coming on board, and um, they said they, a special passenger, I didn't say VIP, special passenger, and would I mind taking this other seat for security reasons, they preferred this passenger to be in the aisle seat. Okay, um, so I scoot over, unpacked, you know, just slid everything over, and again, quite a bit of time passed, and next thing I know, this lady comes on board, and um, older lady, and she sits next to me, and I didn't look, you know, you don't want to stare at anyone, I didn't look at her, um, but I kind of snuck sideways glances, and I'm looking, and right in front of me was the, was my Newsweek, I had a Newsweek magazine waiting for my perusal, and on the front cover, there was this front page expose on the retirement of Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, and so there was her portrait, you know, Chief Justice O'Connor. And I'm looking, and by God, there's Sandra Day O'Connor sitting right next to me. <laughs> so I have to tell you, she was an idol of mine um, growing up. as a She was a female icon for me. My father was very, very uh, persistent that I um, become a strong, dominant female, you know, that... that uh, he wanted me in a high-powered position, wanted me very well-educated, and she became um, part of the Supreme Court uh, when I was probably 10 or 11 years old, so she, she was a, an example. My father wanted me to go into law, so it was part and parcel. And I admit, I struck up a conversation with her. She actually approached me. I didn't want to intrude on her space or anything. and. Um, 
she just asked me, you know, thank, thank me for giving up my seat and um, where am I going? Do I live in Phoenix? And that's just how we started. And for the next five hours, you know, on the flight across country, um, we talked the entire way. And she wanted to know about my life and about Islam. And I pretty much told her everything. I told her I was Muslim, I was a Shiite, and from Syria, and my uh, father was Roman Catholic, and that I was in service to a gay leather man, and I was into uh, BDSM practices, and she had all kinds of questions, and she was legitimately interested, and it wasn't like she was shocked or anything, but she asked me questions the whole way, and so you had a one-on-one -on -one cross examination with Senator O'Connor. Yes, and so now the joke is, Master Bert, and I, I was so excited when I got off the plane. I called my dad and told him, you know, that I got to spend the afternoon or the evening rather with Sandra Day O'Connor. And um, in fact, at the time I was traveling to Tucson. I was living with Master Steve, Master Steve Sampson. Um, I had my husband and I had separated, and I was uh, staying in Tucson. Um, with Master Steve. And so when I arrived in Tucson, um, called Master Steve, uh, was just tickled about it, called my dad, called Master Skip, and just, I was just so excited about this trip. <laughs> <laughs> and Master Steve, I think, was so um, tickled about what we talked about that he, he it really stuck with him. It really resonated that now he thinks the joke is that Sandra Day O'Connor got back to her civilization, you know, her people, and said, oh yeah, I sat next to this really nice Muslim woman and know all about how they live now, you know, that they're into BDSM and they have a <laughs> master-slave relationships, and I don't know what the woman thought. I didn't think of such things, you know. That's, in, a, that's an amazing experience, though. I in mean, the moment, yeah. but... I always, get, I always sit next to crazies in first class. You could just sit next to Sandra Day O'Connor. <laughs> I had a couple good ones, but that was Those my most me. favorite. Um, and I, I was, I just thank God for the for the opportunity. Clearly, it was supposed to happen. Yeah, you know? things happen. So I'm sorry she's retired. Actually, she's, yeah. she's. I've actually agreed with most of her decisions. And me too. Luckily. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I want to uh, wind up here shortly, but okay. I, want, I always like to ask people when I've gotten to the end of an interview is, if there is there anything that I didn't ask you that you were like really afraid I was going to ask you or, or that you thought I would ask you? Well, or? the common question with Master Skip and I is, do we have sex? I mean, huh. a lot of people want to know. Um, <laughs> and I think it's been asked enough that maybe people know, you know, either way. Well, now um, you have to tell us. Well, us. I'm fine with telling you, but uh, the answer is, it depends on how you define it. Um, it if we use the Bill Clintonian de descript it definition would still be no. <laughs> it would still be no. Um, yeah, the Bill Clinton <laughs> definition, the, the textbook definition, technically no. But again, my sexuality is leather. Correct. He's the one that determined and found out uh, that I, was, I am a true masochist in the sexual sense. So there is a huge component of sexual gratification in um, BDSM activities themselves. I think I'm the only one in the family that shares that or has been blessed with that feature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It's a feature. Um, component. But um, no, it is on the table, however. So if he requires that service, if he would ever you know, ordered of me, it would be willingly given. I'm sure he can find better sexual partners in that sense. I'm if not better, perhaps more appropriate to what his inclinations are. Maybe more, are, so more yeah. appropriate to his inclination, but so far he's not, um, that's not been a requirement. But I suppose it is right at the top of everyone's want to know list, isn't it? Yeah. Well, because he is a Kinsey Six. And if, if we have to define things in, uh, in clinical terms, um, I'm a het. I guess I'd be a heterosexual woman. I, I've i tried, uh, it's not that I haven't tried things, but I don't think I lean that way. Right. Pretty clear I don't lean that way, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's, it's, it's a male thing, but no, um, not so far. So that's one question that people often ask. Sure. They often ask me if I'm hot under all this, you right. know, do, am I 
the answer is no. It becomes second skin. It's part of being in the world. So sure. no, I'm not hot. <laughs> wearing this. Um, what else do they ask? That's pretty simple. Those are the two. That That's it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come all this way and do this interview. It's, I hope uh, I it's did. really fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you've de- you know, I've definitely um, opened my eyes on a lot of things and, uh, and you did an excellent job of explaining um, how you got to where you are and where you, what the process you've come through. And I think it's fascinating. I really do. Thank you. I mean, many of us go through an interesting path, but you have, you've had a really interesting path. <laughs> um, and it's not over yet, I'm sure. So. No, it's yeah. not over yet. I believe, I believe there's uh, more to come. I'm really in the middle of my second act here, so, um, yeah, there's a lot more to come, I think. Sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.